Have you heard the good news? God loves you. God loves you. Let's look at the scripture today in 1 John chapter number 5, verses 11 through verse number 13. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. Adopted and assured. Adopted and assured. You didn't know I was adopted, did you? No, you didn't know that. But if you're a child of God, you are adopted also. We're taken from our earthly family. We're adopted into God's heavenly family. That means that you have a new family in God, new brothers and sisters that you look around. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. A new family. In your bulletin, there's a sermon outline. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he saves you from your sins and eternity in hell. This is called salvation. Salvation. Salvation is what takes place within our hearts. When we give our life to God, we're saved. The Bible says that all things are passed away and all things become new. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever was, is a has been. Now we look forward to the new life that God has given us. Salvation. And no other name except the name of Jesus. Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Their tombs are still filled. The only one that can save you is the name of Jesus Christ. And at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. If you got a sickness, that sickness has a name. If you got a condition, that condition has a name. Whatever is failing you in your life, it has a name. But if you would exalt the name of Jesus above that name, then that name has a surrender to the name of Jesus. <laughs> Cancer cannot exist in the presence of God. Poverty cannot exist in the presence of God. So you don't need more of you. You need more of God. Ask God to come in and watch those things flee. Darkness always surrenders to light. Salvation. No other name except in the name of Jesus. Old things are passed away. The Bible says that all things now become new based on this relationship. But even beyond that, there's something called justification. Justification means that now you're saved, but we got to deal with the things that got us in that point in the first place. We've got to clear out some things. Justification is like being free of all charges, being declared innocent. You're now righteous before God. God has wiped away all of your sins. He's removed the stain, the burden, the guilt, and the shame. And now God has called you his very own. You have been justified. That means just if you'd never done it. And even the next step is sanctification. This is the cleansing and washing where God starts to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all of your negative ways, that anger issue, all the problems of your life. God begins to take all that away as he restores you to what he would have you to be. So it's not enough just to be saved. We're justified and we are sanctified in Christ. Amen. Now, next point, going back to your bulletin, your outline, God doesn't give us what we deserve, which is judgment. No, no, no. He gives us what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness and justification. God does not give us what we deserve. That's, I'm so glad that God is merciful, aren't you? Aren't you glad God don't give us what we deserve? That God is kind and God is gentle. God is full of grace. And even when we deserve justice and punishment, that God sometimes just lets us go. I wish my mother used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
What does God say? God says he disciplines those he loves. Sometimes we're going through things. We're crying out for God to release us. And God is watching us go through it. He says that I am with you. And my grace is sufficient for you. Which means God gives you just enough of what you need to make it through that situation. We want a way out. God says, no, I want to show you the way through. Because some things we only learn as we're going through. If you were taken out, you would miss the lesson of what God was trying to do in you and with you in the situation. Be grateful sometimes that God trusts you enough to go through some things. That God positions you there so that you can grow through, not just go through. God says grow through it. Become better on the other side. We don't want to just finish and say, oh, I'm glad that's over. Finish with the lesson. Learn what God wants us to learn in our life. That way we can become better and not bitter. Grow through every situation. In Romans chapter number three, in verse number 23, the scripture shares that all have sinned. That means none of us are righteous. None of us are so right with God. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If we just trust God and we stay with God and we walk through this barren land here, we have an eternity that's awaiting us. This is temporary. Whatever you're dealing with right now is temporary. And when we look back in eternity, it was just a speck, just a glimmer of time when we went through this place that we live right now. It's not forever. We have an eternal resting place in heaven and we can celebrate while we're here. Don't celebrate once you get there. Celebrate every moment, every day, every experience that God brings you through because it brings you closer and closer to your eternal destination. Yes. Romans chapter number eight, verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirits of God, they are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And that scripture says you're, if you're led by the spirit. Doesn't say that if you suffer long enough. Doesn't say that if you pray. Doesn't say that if you go to church. It says if you're led by the spirit of God, then you are sons of God and daughters of God. And the Spirit of God recognizes that, and the Bible says it brings you into what's called adoption. You're now adopted into the family of God. You're no longer a part of what you used to be. You're now part of, of the body of Christ, joint heir with Jesus Christ. That means that every promise in Scripture, every promise that God has made in His Word, you can put your name on it. You can claim everything that God has said in his word. Where God talks about healing, you can put your name on it. He talks about prosperity, you can put your name on it. He talks about peace, you can put your name on it. Every word of God is true and it's meant for you. But we have an enemy, an adversary, who does not want us to believe that the word of God still applies as it did 2,000 years ago. Miracles still happen today, just as they did 2,000 years ago. The Bible says we suffer because of our unbelief. Do we really believe that if you can lay hands on the sick, they shall recover? Do you really believe that you can speak the word of God, and when you speak the word of God, it's not you speaking, it's God speaking? Whenever the word of God is spoken, it's not you speaking anymore. God gives you the authority to speak his word. So no matter where you are, find the word of God and speak what God says, not what you say. Demons don't respond to your word. Sickness does not respond to your word. Calamity does not respond to your word. But at the word of Jesus Christ, everything has to respond under the authority that's given to you. If you work in a certain job or a certain position, you're given authority. And you can only use the authority that is given. When we are a child of God, we're given all authority that's in heaven. All authority is no longer there, it rests in you. And when you speak the authority of God, you're speaking the word. And everything under that authority has to respond. Yes. When the disciples went out in, in twos and they went out and they healed, 
and they cast out demons and they performed miracles. They came back saying, Jesus, I'm amazed what, what, what happened when we spoke your word. Jesus said, you should not be amazed. You see me do it and greater things than these you shall do. Don't be amazed at what God will do for you if you avail yourself to him. God just wants someone who's willing and bold enough to step out on faith and believe what God says in his word. If you will simply believe God, God's word will prove whatever you believe him to be. God can never go above your faith. If you don't believe God can do it, no matter how much you can pray and believe and connect with your prayer group, if you don't believe and you don't have faith, God cannot go above your faith. Even in healing, God says, do you believe that I can heal you? Then God says, be it according to your faith. Not how much we're praying. We can pray a long time. But if you really believe God, that could be a short prayer. God, do it. Oh, yes, yes, God, do it. Is that it? Just God, do it. And if you believe God for it, whatever you believe God for has to come to pass. It don't take a long list of prayers and keep you on the prayer list a long time. The woman touched the hem of his garment and the Bible says immediately the blood dried up immediately. She had been suffering for 18 years, went to physicians, did not get better, but got worse and worse. But she touched the hem of his garment and she said, if I could just, she said it, she said it, she said it, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. In other words, the prophecy is in what you've been saying. You do not have what you see, you have what you say. What are you saying about your situation? I'm constantly trying to correct people who says, well, it doesn't seem like things are going to change. The devil is a liar. It changes the moment you believe that God gives you the authority to speak it. It even says, speak those things that are not as though they are. So what's not there? Don't talk about what's missing. Talk about what God is giving you. Talk about what you already have. Did you know that before you receive your blessing, before you can actually see it, you already have it? You already have it. It's going from the heavenly realm down to the earthly realm. As soon as you pray a prayer of faith, God grants your request. But the problem is we don't start shouting until we see it. If you really know God, as soon as you pray it, you start shouting because you know that God's already released you. You pray it by faith. I prayed it. I believe that God has already granted it. Now I'm going to dance. I'm going to shout. Dance in advance because God has already delivered the promise. I know that takes crazy faith. Doesn't make sense. But the Bible says that we walk by faith, not by sight. That means when you see it, that they, it's happened way before you see it. It's like a health condition. If you're diagnosed with a condition, the condition was there way before the diagnosis. You, you just detected it. You already had it way back at the beginning, but by the time they come and told you what you've got, you've already had it. The same is true with God. Whatever God gives you, you already had it way back when you prayed. If you just believe God, you already there. It was already granted to you. It wasn't there when, every, when, you, when it shows up, it wasn't there. It showed up the moment you prayed and believed God. Point number three. Number three, our assurance of adoption. Our assurance. God disciplines his children. Thank you, God. God disciplines those he loves. God will discipline those he loves. The challenging thing for parents is to let their children go and to believe that when they go that God is taking care of them because they have to go to find out that they really do need, number one, God, and two, they really do need you. When we try to hold on so strongly to something, we can squeeze the very life out of it. We can squeeze breath out of something by holding on too tightly. Sometimes we got to let go and believe the freedom in letting something go is the freedom that God needs to bring life to where it really needs to be. It's amazing what happens when we just let go and let God and just trust him enough that when you let go, God is not forgotten about you 
And when you get out there on your own, I want you to know you're going to go through some difficult time. You're going to go through some calamity. Some storms are going to come. But God says, I'm still with you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And like the prodigal son, he was out there and he had to come to himself. Everybody has to get to a point where we come to ourselves and know that we do need God. It's not God that needs us. We need God. And the first coming into ourselves is when we ask God to come in. And it's like homecoming. If you've ever been away a long time and you finally you go back home, there's something about getting close to home. You can feel it down in your soul. There's something about being grounded again. And nobody can ground you like God can. God lets you see the real you. When you're in God, God grows up the you that you ultimately need to be. Because we try to do it all without God. But when we surrender ourselves, that's the beginning of the true you that God knows. The second one, God is an approachable father. God is approachable. Matthew chapter number 11, verse 28. It says, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a promise from God. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God's telling you, if you're tired, if you're weary, if you're burdened, God says, come. Come. Come unto me. When you can sleep 12 hours a day and you wake up tired. When you, you, you I need a different mattress. <clears throat> I'll get a beauty rest mattress. Yeah, I'll get this one. I'll spend $10,000 on a mattress. Mattresses can't give you rest. Amen. You know, when I get a different job, oh, it's the stress of work. When things change in my life, then I'll be able to rest. A, a change in your life won't bring you rest. Making more money won't bring you rest. There's a rest that your soul needs. And you cannot get that rest in substance, in the world, in satisfaction, in anything that the world can bring you. That rest can only come from God. And it's given to you freely. He says, come unto me and I will give you rest. In 1 John chapter 5, and verse 14, <clears throat> We pray. And it says this is the confidence that we have in him, which means in God, that if we ask anything according to his will. And that's a condition there. According to his will, he hears us. Let's pause for a moment. The Bible says that I can have confidence when I come before God, that if I ask anything, that means nothing, nothing is left out. But the one condition according to God's will is every prayer that we're praying According to the will of God. Does that prayer come back so that God gets glory? Are you praying so that ultimately this brings you into a closer relationship with God? Does your freedom, does, does God granting you your request allow somebody else in your life to witness what God is doing and to be brought closer in relationship with God? Ultimately, God says, pray according to his will, not always our will. And when we do that, the Bible says clearly he hears us. What is God listening for in your prayer? His will. He's listening for you to pray his will, not what you want. God, what do you want? That's the kind of prayer that God wants to hear. We're putting God first. When God says you put him first in all of your ways and everything else adds to you and God promises that he will add no sorrow to you that whatever God brings you is going to be a blessing and you ultimately will be a blessing back to God so God hears us in verse 15 and if we know that he hears us if I know if I know God heard my prayer I can shout if I know God heard my prayer I can celebrate I know God heard my prayer. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. That's something about knowing that everything is well with your soul. There's a confidence that you have when you know that you're right with God. 
When you were out there in the world and you were having a good time and trying to break every commandment in one night, you knew that God, God, that, that's something that wasn't settling right about that. We couldn't ask God to bless that. It's like when you eat junk food. I don't know if you eat a lot of whole bunch of junk food. It feels good, but afterwards you feel terrible. But there's something about knowing that you're doing well and you're eating well and you're taking good care of yourself and, and you're taking care of your family and you're in the right relationship with God. There's something about living that way and having a peace about your life. That's what God wants everybody to have. That peace, the Bible says, that passes all understanding. And see, see, Father, his promises are true. We can trust God on that, that everything that God's ever given you is yea and amen. Every promise that he's made to you is true. Eternal life is yours. You can stand on God's promises to you. You are forgiven. You're justified. You're adopted into the family of God. As I summarize, first, who you were. We were all children born into slavery. And that slavery is sin. And we recognize the error of our ways and how we're living. The first order is to cry out to God and to open our heart and say, God, come into my heart. And then you're no longer what you were. You now who you are. You are now adopted into the family of God. You are a son or a daughter of God. You are joint heir with Jesus Christ. You have heaven as your eternal resting place. And then God began the process of justification. Can you imagine having all of your debt wiped away? All your, all your stuff cleansed. All unrighteousness. God's taken away those habits of yours. Taken away that anger. Taken away all the bitterness. Everything that shouldn't be. And the world can look at you differently because of that relationship. And then what God did for us. He redeemed us. When Jesus hung on that cross in Calvary. And they were persecuting him, says, crucify him. And the same way Jesus looked down and he wasn't angry. He looked down and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Salvation is when you're doing what you're doing and God is saying, forgive them. But then when we finally look up to God, you say, God, forgive me. When you really want God to forgive you and you want to bring your heart and your life to God, that's true salvation. That's when God brings you into his family. God adopts you and you have the assurance that you now are a child of God. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you that we can be assured that this is temporary.